These reports and this event were truly collaborative undertakings requiring the collective support of the Interprofessional Education Consortium, a coalition of six national health professions education organizations representing medicine, pharmacy, dentistry, public health nursing, and public health and nursing. And we have both allopathic and osteopathic medicine represented here today, as well as three healthcare foundations, including the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the ABIM Foundation. A very special partner in the critical work underway to enhance integrated team-based care delivery is the Health Resources and Services Administration, a branch of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This afternoon, we are pleased and very honored to have HRSA Administrator and fellow nurse Mary Wakefield with us to share remarks about the importance of interprofessional education and practice to enhancing quality health care outcomes and achieving superior patient outcomes. President Obama appointed Dr. Wakefield to her post at HRSA in February 2009. This agency works to bridge the healthcare gaps for people who live outside the economic and medical mainstream. The agency uses its $7 billion annual budget to expand access to quality healthcare in partnership with healthcare providers and health professions education programs. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wakefield. also just begin by thanking all of the leaders up here and probably a few of you in the audience as well who have been uh, facilitating this uh, important effort to better prepare our health workforce for the team-based care and care coordination strategies that comprise some of the important underpinnings of the Affordable Care Act delivery system reforms. And I think perhaps that, that uh, well beyond my remarks, the, as I walked in, this behind me speaks volumes to this initiative. That is that perhaps in some cases, this is the first time that some of these organizations have been working in partnership around this uh, any shared goal, but certainly this shared goal. So it really is a landmark day to have the interest and the expertise and the commitment of these many organizations to this new initiative. And I would say from HRSA's vantage point, we are very pleased to be a partner in this effort, along with the Interprofessional uh, Education Collaborative, the Macy Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation, and a number of others. And in a few minutes, you're going to hear from some of them about the details of the reports that are being announced today. But for my part in this, I'd like to focus my remarks on what we mean when we talk about interprofessional education, its importance in improving healthcare in America, and why now is the time to engage this very important agenda item. When we talk about interprofessional education, we mean quite simply learning together with the aim of together delivering high quality care. So rather than training the next generation workforce in health professions silos, interprofessional education means creating both academic and clinical experiences for students, experiences that advance the goal of health professionals working in collaboration to provide the very best patient-centered care. Research indicates that teams of health professionals working in a coordinated manner to deliver patient care are associated with better patient outcomes, and with greater patient satisfaction in that care. 10 years ago, I was privileged to be a member of the Institute of Medicine's committee that produced two reports in 2001, the Two Eras Human Report and Crossing the Quality Chasm. And in the Chasm Report at that time, we called on academic institutions to begin to educate health professionals to work as partners as members of collaborative teams capable of efficiently and effectively responding to and resolving patients' broad range of, a patient's broad range of problems and issues. And while there has certainly been movement in response to that recommendation, including the important work on designing and implementing medical homes and other strategies, the Affordable Care Act, from our vantage point, markedly strengthens this focus. This focus on what best care needs to look like, and what health professions education needs to look like in order to achieve that best care. 
HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius pointed the way forward in recent testimony to the Senate Finance Committee when she said, and I quote, too often health care takes place in a series of fragments or episodes. We need to make it possible for entirely new levels of seamlessness, coordination, and cooperation to emerge among the people and the entities that provide health care so as to smooth the journeys of patients and families through their care, over time, and in different places, end quote. The Affordable Care Act recognizes that better care coordination is at the core of improving health care quality and safety. For example, accountable care organizations, value-based purchasing, and other strategies can result in fewer hospital admissions, fewer health care-caused infections, better care transitions, and other steps that improve health outcomes. Gains in these areas are inextricably tied to better care coordination. Care coordination also will play a key role in the Affordable Care Act's push to foster a culture of health and wellness across the country. While it's received relatively little attention in some corners of the American public at large, disease prevention and health promotion activities are major points of emphasis in the Affordable Care Act. Integration of this focus throughout the healthcare system will require stronger interprofessional collaboration. It will require nurses, primary care physicians, pharmacists, psychologists, dentists, public health providers, and others to promote health, uh, to promote health by engaging multiple disciplines that work in teams. We know that strengthening features of the healthcare delivery system alone will not get us to our goal. To succeed, the health professionals that deliver that care need to be in, educated in ways that model and promote effective care coordination. In partnership with states, universities, and healthcare systems, my agency, the Health Resources and Services Administration, plays a key role in partnership in health professions training. And as some of you know, we have a history of and a commitment to interprofessional teamwork. For example, HRSA staffs the Advisory Committee on Interdisciplinary Community-Based Linkages, which was created by Congress and is focused on these issues for a number of years. We also promote the training of interdisciplinary teams of health professionals through our workforce programs, including geriatric training and through some of our continuing education initiatives. And in addition to that background, the Affordable Care Act gives us new tools to advance interprofessional training, including focusing on clinical teaching that promotes team-based care, care coordination, and other key elements of collaborative learning and practice. We have also given priority to these issues through the budget process. President Obama's budget for fiscal year 2012 proposes new investments in team-based training across health disciplines. And this past February, we were pleased to be part of a meeting to advance interprofessional education that was convened with the partners that I recognized at the beginning of my remarks. And we're also excited, looking forward, about the next steps. I really think that we are, in fact, particularly well positioned to, subst to substantively move this agenda forward in that direction that was called for by the Institute of Medicine now 11 years ago. We are well positioned to advance interprofessional education because we have, for example, leaders like President Obama and Secretary Sebelius who are supportive of innovation in healthcare, innovation that drives toward greater effectiveness and greater efficiency. We have provisions of the Affordable Care Act now that give us more robust opportunities to pursue the same. And we have increasingly well-informed patients who want care teams that coordinate and collaborate with their best interests as the goal. We have new health information technology and new research findings that we can use to support new care models that harness the capacities of the respective healthcare disciplines. And finally, I think it is also important to note that because our resources do have limits, it's our obligation to apply them as effectively as possible in ways that produce better care outcomes for patients. As part of this effort, the healthcare community is engaging new strategies and new ways of organizing and delivering care to optimize our collective efforts. And teamwork is just fundamental to that conversation. 
Today's launching of a set of interprofessional competencies to be disseminated and encouraged for use in health professions education and practice represents real and tangible progress. It's a very important step. And I thank again all of us in, involved in getting us here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wakefield. Your support is so important to us. I'm Carol Ashenbrenner, Executive Vice President of the Association of American Medical Colleges. And at the beginning of Dr. Wakefield's remarks, I had a moment of dis-ease because she cited some of the same things I was going to know. <laughs> and that was quickly replaced by a sigh of relief that we really are on the same page about the factors in the environment that suggest this time it's different. This time our call to meaningful interprofessional education has much more fertile soil than it has in the efforts over the past 40 years. In late 2009, the leaders of our six associations represented here met to explore ways that we might work together to advance a shared vision. The vision that all learners in at least dentistry, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, and public health should be prepared to practice team-based care across the spectrum from prevention to acute, chronic, and palliative care. We recognize all the factors in the environment that Dr. Wakefield just cited. And the outcome of that meeting was the formation of the Interprofessional Education Collaborative, or IPEC, which is a unique collaboration among our six associations. We had worked together on other things, but this time is different for all of us. Our collaborative quickly developed an action plan to encourage and assist our member institutions to integrate meaningful, patient-centered, interprofessional learning for all health profession students. The first step in that action plan was to develop a common language, a common set of competencies that could be foundational for collaborative practice and team-based care. The expert panel was charged to propose such common language and competencies, building on work previously done by other specific disciplines, both here and abroad. Report of this expert panel recommends four domains of interprofessional competency. They are values and ethics, roles and responsibilities, interprofessional communication, and teamwork. Each of these domains has specific behavioral sub-competencies that further specify what we expect of all health professionals. These competencies together represent a pathway for professional development that the panel deems interprofessionality, a pathway that will prepare them for intentional collaboration in the interest of better care for those that we serve. And it's interesting to me that what brought us to this day was a series of collaborations among our associations, among the panel members who came from the six different professions, uh, with our government partners and with our foundation partners. A good start, I think. So we all share a dream that safe, high-quality, accessible, person-centered, and population-oriented care is what we really want for all the people we serve. This care must be a team effort. No single profession alone can achieve this goal. The proposed competencies will build a path to collaborative health care, a collaborative health care workforce, and the improved care that we all desire. And we hope that all of the health professions will embrace these competencies and bring them to life along the continuum of professional education, training, practice, and continued learning. And the six of us are meeting tomorrow morning to plan the next step in our action plan. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I'm Lucinda Bain, the EVP and CEO of the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. Good afternoon. As you've now heard Drs. Wakefield and Ashenbrenner clearly describe, interprofessional education and team-based care, while intuitively appealing, are challenging constructs to translate into our educational programs and patient-centered practices. Educators can't do it alone. Practice leaders can't simply mandate the change. 
and there is not a simple legislative or policy solution to fully integrate these practices and competencies into our systems. It is therefore truly a moment in history that finds alignment in the work of many organizations and individuals with a shared commitment to address both the opportunities and the obstacles for forward progress. This includes educators, practitioners, philanthropic leaders, and health systems administrators in both the public and the private sectors. But there is much work ahead beginning at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. And it's my pleasure to first call upon Mary Joan Ladden, Senior Program Officer with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, to describe the outcomes of that February meeting that have been mentioned and convened jointly by HRSA and their uh, foundation partners. And then Macy Foundation President, Dr. George Tebow, will then close with the presentation, close our presentation by sharing the perspective on how philanthropic organizations' priorities align with our shared aims for significant advancements in interprofessional education and practice. Mary Jones. Thank you, Lucinda. And this has truly been a historic collaboration for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And we're very, very proud uh, to support the collaboration, to support the interprofessional competencies, and to support the report of the meeting in February. Uh, as a foundation, we can't achieve our mission to improve the health and health care of all Americans without truly getting everyone involved, teams, individuals, populations, families involved in their care. I'm a nurse practitioner, very proud to be here on in Nurses Week, uh, and so I've seen firsthand the, um, the challenges of collaboration and the dangers of having no collaboration. Um, the challenges, especially when busy health professionals are thrown together for the first time in a chaotic practice setting, when they haven't been prepared to be able to work together. It's a, it's a huge challenge that we put young health professionals especially into. And the harm to patients when health professionals are really not ready to collaborate and to work together. And our patients expect more from us. Our patients expect us to be able to communicate effectively, to work together well, to be able to have seamless work across the continuum of care. We owe it to our patients to take this step forward. So you can sense from my remarks, I think, and from the remarks of those that have gone before me and will go after me, that there's an urgency here. There's an urgency, now is the time to make this happen. So that's why we, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, HRSA, the Macy Foundation, the ABIM Foundation, came together in a historic collaboration to fund the development of the competencies, but more important, the dissemination, because this is the time to get them out there. And there was consensus at the meeting in February to not just um, put a, a rubber stamp on the competencies per se, but to say this is the time to move them forward. This is the time to look at funding. This is the time to look at collaborations. And we know that the best reports Hopefully you've seen this outside. Shameless plug. Uh, the, be the best reports often stay on the shelf. Uh, and, uh, you know, even 10 or 11 years later, uh, we're still trying to push the Quality Chasm Report and other IOM reports. So we've developed an action plan to try to bring this forward. And we will be working together to launch a durable uh, campaign to make sure that all stakeholders whether they're in practice, education, research, policy, healthcare organizations, insurers and payers, work together to try to assure that health professional students are prepared to be able to work together. We'll also work together to do the research that's needed to link interprofessional education, the use of collaborative healthcare teams, and high quality, safe, and efficient patient care. We'll also forge partnerships between the academic community, healthcare organizations and providers, foundations, and government agencies. Transformation is never easy, but we've begun today to do that. So we believe, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and all of us here, 
believe that the time is now. We've talked about this for a long time. Probably many of you were in the audience for previous press conferences and previous efforts like this. But now is the time, and we need to move forward. It supports our mission as a foundation, and it supports good health care for all Americans. Thank you. It's daunting to be the sixth speaker <laughs> of such an illustrious group of people that precede me that have said almost everything important to be said. So I'm not going to speak from a prepared text. I want to give you four take-home points and then bring it back to the mission of the Macy Foundation. Those four points are why is interprofessional education so important? Why is the initiatives in these two reports a key part of moving this forward? Why I'm heartened because there's some movement already going on, what some of the lessons we've already learned, and then bring it back to our mission. We have good evidence, as Mary Wakefield told us, that healthcare delivered in teams is better healthcare in terms of efficiency, patient outcomes, and patient satisfaction, and we should know also professional satisfaction. Yet if you look at how we train all of our health professionals today, we still do it in silos. So we're beginning to break those down. It's still not the norm. We will not have effective reform of our delivery system unless we change the behaviors that we imprint at the beginning of the process. There is an inexorable link between what we do educationally and what we do in the delivery system. And we can't change the delivery system without changing education. That's why this is so important. And that's why this initiative, the leadership of these six health professional organizations representing the schools that do the training for six health professions, and the leadership of that organization has gone on the line to say this is important. This is the first time that's ever happened. And then in partnership, private, public partnership, in thought leaders all coming together. And it's only by that combination of leadership from the health professions, public-private partnerships, and thought leaders across the professions all agreeing. And these reports tell you that that's happening. Now, I'm encouraged because we're involved now in schools around the country that are beginning to break down the silos. Six pairs of nursing schools and medical schools work with us in IHI to develop curriculum for teaching quality improvement and patient safety. Seven pairs of nursing schools and medical schools came together with us in the Carnegie Foundation to work on specific elements of curriculum reform. In about a dozen schools across the country, with varying combinations of health professions, medicine and nursing at the core, but including dentistry, uh, social work, pharmacy, public health, are working on curriculum reform projects together. So already we're beginning to learn some lessons, and I think it's very important to emphasize and why maybe we've failed in the past. And the first lesson is that only if there's leadership from the top of the organizations can this happen. The deans have to be involved and sign off on it to get over the logistical problems that have been the barriers to this in the past. The second is that this only happens with thoughtful planning. And it only happens if it's done rigorously. These are not casual social encounters. This is not about getting people together like at a mixer. This is serious work with important educational goals, with rigor, with metrics, and with outcomes measured. We know that that can happen, and we're beginning to see it happening. It also uses new technology. Simulation, computers, all can be brought together as a way to facilitate this interprofessional work, and we already see examples of that. So the movement is start, has started, and this is a way to accelerate the movement. And we at the Macy Foundation, which is committed to improving the health of the public through improving health professions education, have made this a central piece of our mission, of our grant-giving mission, of our conference mission, of our advocacy mission, and of our training mission. And we believe that it's only in this way that will fulfill our promise to the public that we will have more accessible care, we will have more reliable care, and we will have more efficient care. And this is an absolutely essential tool to accomplish that. So I'm so proud of being part of this effort, so proud of my colleagues that have taken the initiative and the leadership, and I really think it's going to happen this time. Thank you.